Well, good morning, New Day. It's so good to see you guys. Thanks so much for coming out. A big thank you to everyone who's tuned in online. However you're joining us, I am just thrilled that you're here. For those of you who are new, my name's Mike. I have the privilege of serving here as lead pastor, and it's such a privilege to get to teach you the Word of God today. Uh, For those just joining us right now as a church, we're in a study through the wonderful Gospel of Matthew, and we've just been taking it one section at a time, and that's brought us to the section that we're covering today, which is Matthew chapter 18, verses 10 to 14, where Jesus is going to teach us a really important lesson about the straying believer. Years back, my wife Kristen and I owned this Cairn Terrier named Hunter. You recognize this? It's the Toto dog from Wizard the Oz. Oh, let's get a dog. It'll be so cute. We named it Hunter. We should have named it Stupid. (laughs) Because this thing was as smart as a bag of hammers. They say small dog, small brain, and I can testify to that sentiment. This thing caused me so much grief, I cannot even tell you. That's why Hunter now lives in Boston with a nice family. (laughs) We'd leave the front door open for two seconds. Boom! He would take off and go running throughout the whole neighborhood. We'd be in the backyard, and one of the kids would have to come in or out of the gate. Thing was hiding in a bush. The gate would open. Boom! Would take off again. Even when the gate wasn't open, it would find ways because of its diminutive stature, and it would get through the little slats in the wood fence. So we had to end up putting chicken wire all over the fence. I'm like, hon, I didn't buy no chicken. I bought a dog. What the heck are we doing here? This is crazy. But off he would go. And I was baffled as to why in the world he would keep running away. Was it all the love we gave him? Was it all the attention we gave him? Was it the food that we supplied in abundance that we had uh, to him 24-7? Was it the snacks that we provided? Was it all the clean water that we uh, you know, gave to him? What made him run away? Was it his desire to be eaten by the bobcats and the coyotes and the red tail hawks and the black bear and the bobcats that roam our wood adjacent neighborhood? I mean, what in the world was going on with this thing? I never did figure it out. Whatever it was that caused them to go, Hunter had a tendency to stray. Now, here's the deal. Mankind has a whole lot more in common with man's best friend than we would like to admit. It would be awesome if the moment we accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, it became a biblical impossibility for us to stray. Uh, But unfortunately, this is just not the case. The Bible doesn't talk about if it happens. It kind of has more the position when it happens. And it's going to happen. Believers from time to time, they're going to get off the right path, they're going to run away from God. And when it happens, those of us who are followers of Jesus, we have a responsibility to perform before God. And it is that responsibility that Jesus is going to highlight for us in the text that we're studying today, which again is Matthew chapter 18, verses 10 to 14. We're going to see three things in our text today. Number one, the rule. Number two, the reason. And number three, the responsibility. And we're going to go through these one at a time, beginning with the rule. The rule. And Jesus lays out the rule for us in the first part of verse 10, where he says, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. From the immediate context, we learn that Jesus is in Capernaum, Peter's hometown, giving a private teaching to his 12 disciples, likely in the Apostle Peter's house. Jesus picks up one of Peter's kids, holds them in his arm, and that child of Peter represents the child of God. 
And Jesus lays out this rule. When you see a child of God straying, my rule is you shall not despise him. Now, friends, the word despise means to treat something as if it has little or no value. Think of it like this. Have you ever walked along and saw a discarded lottery ticket on the ground? Have you ever, like me, picked it up (laughs) hoping that someone accidentally dropped a ticket worth $300 million? I used to do that when I was younger. Nowadays, I just walk on by going, the people who buy these things, trust me, they check them, you know? And so nowadays, I just despise the ticket. I treat it as worthless. I used to think it had valued, so I'd pick it up. I would be careful. I would hold it gently in case this was my ticket to riches and fame and all this kind of stuff. But nowadays, I despise it. I don't care. I don't think it's valuable. I view it as worthless, and I just walk on by. And this is precisely what Jesus is forbidding us to do when we come across a fellow believer who is straying from God. We are not to just walk on by. We're not to show no interest. We're not to show no care. We're not to show no concern. This is Jesus's rule. Now the question begs, why would Jesus give this rule? And that leads us very nicely into the second thing we see in our text, which we're going to call the reason. First, the rule, now the reason. Why is it so important that we don't despise a fellow believer when they stray? Why is it so important that we don't act like we don't care? Well, Jesus tells us in the latter part of verse 10, why? He says, for, meaning because. I tell you that in heaven, their angels, the angels of the believers who are straying, their angels, they always see the face of my father who is in heaven. What Jesus is saying is you shouldn't despise them because of how much God the father cares about them. And that's what we see here in verse 10. We see a picture of God's care for the believer. The picture is this, it's the throne room of God. And here is God the Father sitting on his majestic throne, surrounded by legions of angels whose sole purpose is to serve God by attending to the care of his people. And friends, in case you don't know, that is what angels do. As the author of Hebrews put it, In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, ministering spirits are sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. So God created the legions of angels, yes, to serve him, but to serve him how? To serve him by attending to the needs of God's children. And the idea is this, if God views his children as so valuable that he would create legions of angels to serve them, and if he cares so much about them that he's constantly dispatching angels to aid his children when and where needed, then how dare we despise them by treating them as if they're a worthless, discarded lottery ticket on the ground. So do you see the reason for the rule? We're not to despise because of the intrinsic value of each and every child of God. They're precious to God, and they must be treated as precious by us. We must follow God's example by dispatching help when and where it is needed. And friends, understand when a believer strays, help is indeed needed. Okay, number one, the rule. Number two, the reason. And now, number three, the responsibility. The responsibility. We see this in verses 12 to 14, where Jesus says this to his disciples. He says, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains 
and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. Here, Jesus shares a story that his disciples could have readily related to because of the day and age in which they live, where shepherding was a common trade. Today, we have pavers and we have painters and we have uh, plumbers, but in the time of Christ, shepherding was just as common of a trade. Now, it was very typical for each family in a town or a village to own at least a couple sheep. They were valuable to people as a source of uh, wool for clothing, as a source of uh, milk, you know, for food, as a source of uh, milk for, for drinking, and as a source of meat for eating. So these were valuable to people. But every family didn't want to carve time out of their day to go bring the sheep grazing in the field or on the mountainside where it could get the grass that it needed. And so it was common practice for a village to go ahead and hire at least a couple shepherds to go ahead and care for the flock. Now, sheep are pretty stupid creatures, and like my former dog, Hunter, are prone to stray. And in Israel, there's no shortage of places for them to get lost. When inevitably a sheep would go astray, one of the shepherds would head out to find the lost sheep. They would leave the 99 in the care of one of the other shepherds, and then they would go searching in all the typical spots that sheep were prone to stray to. Now, the very fact that the shepherd was willing to go after the sheep shows its intrinsic value. Again, it had value because of its wool, because of its milk, because of its meat. So it was valuable. So the shepherd went after it. And the shepherd would search and search and search until he found it. Because here's the deal. If that shepherd got the reputation as being the shepherd that lost people's sheep, how many of you understand that shepherd is quickly going to be unemployable? And so he would search and search and search for that sheep that had strayed until he found it. And when he did, how happy he was. And how happy was the person that had entrusted that sheep to that shepherd's care. So he would walk in well past the hour when the sheep were normally returned, and he would say, I found it. And they would all celebrate. Now, after sharing this story, Jesus says this, and just as a good shepherd doesn't want the sheep to stay lost, which would spell certain death for the sheep, so it is not my will. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that even one of these little ones should perish. God doesn't want a single one of his children to go away and to stay away, which would lead to them perishing spiritually. Now, in Luke's gospel, Jesus employs this illustration to make the point that God has care and concern for the lost. But here in Matthew's gospel, the illustration, the same illustration is employed to teach about God's care and concern, not for the lost, but for the believer who has strayed. But whether you're in Luke's gospel or Matthew's gospel, each time the story is employed, it does more than communicate God's care and concern. It also shares our responsibility as disciples of Jesus. If a person's lost, as a shepherd would go after a lost sheep, so we are to go after lost people. And if it's a believer who has strayed, like a good shepherd, we are to go after the straying sheep, doing what we can to rope it and bring it back into the fold. So friends, do you see it here? In verses 12 to 14, we are dealing with our responsibility before God. We're to go after the one who has strayed and try to bring him back into the flock. When I was in Bible college, I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I graduated. So I took every course that was available. I was like, I'll take youth pastor courses, I'll take missionary courses, I'll take evangelist courses. I, I just took it all because I didn't know uh, what God was going to call me to do. 
Well, in one of my youth ministry courses, uh, my professor, Darren Heilman, uh, taught me something that I have never to this day forgotten. He said, Mike, to be a good youth pastor, it's really just as simple as doing these three things. Number one, love them unconditionally. Number two, lead them by your example. And number three, lasso them when they stray. Friends, can I tell you that what he told me in terms of being a good youth pastor has relevance for anyone desiring to be a good disciple of Jesus? This is universal advice. It's not just for those wanting to be youth pastors. It's for every follower of Jesus. We're to love people unconditionally. We're to lead them by our good example, but we are also to seek to lasso them when they stray. And Jesus says this is going to happen from time to time. It is not an impossibility that once you come to Christ, you always remain on the straight and narrow. What happens is this. We have a tendency to veer. We have a tendency to stray we have a tendency at times to get lost. And God says when that happens and when you see that happening in the life of another person, it is your Christian duty to go after them. Now, since this is the ministry that God has entrusted to us, we have to know what to look for. We have to know the signs that a fellow believer is straying from God. Now, there's so many different ones, but I've taken all the information that's out there, and I'm going to share with you the four most common signs to look for that someone is straying from God. Number one is loss of interest. When you observe a loss of interest in spiritual activities, you know you have someone that's straying. When people are straying from God, they lose interest in prayer. They lose interest in reading their Bible. They lose interest in coming to church. They lose interest in Christian fellowship. They lose interest in discussing their faith with other believers, but they also certainly lose interest in sharing their faith with those who are far from God. When someone who's straying attends church, again, loss of interest. They attend church, they're apathetic in worship if they participate at all. And when the sermon begins, they're looking at their phone, they're looking at their watch, just waiting for it to be done. Has nothing to do with whether the sermon's good or bad. They just want to get out and move on to something else, which is of interest to them. So when you see and can observe in the life of a Christian friend or family member just this loss of interest in spiritual things, parents, maybe you see it in your children or maybe you see it in a friend, maybe you see it in in someone uh, in your small group, maybe you see it in someone on your serving team. When you see it, know this, that person is likely straying from God. Okay, that's loss of interest. Now, number two, is loss of priorities. You might know someone and at a certain time in their life, they were doing Matthew 6.33. They were seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and God was number one in their life. But now as you look over their life, not that you're the Holy Spirit police, not that you're going around making it your job to evaluate everyone else. It's just all of a sudden you start seeing that now they're prioritizing career over God. Now they're prioritizing the accumulation of material possessions over God. Now they're prioritizing hobbies over God. Now they're prioritizing an ungodly relationship over their relationship with God. And when you see that, you know the person has strayed. Number three, the third sign that someone's straying is loss of holiness. Here's what happens. You begin to observe questionable behavior. The wife says, oh my goodness, I'm just chatting on Facebook. I'm not cheating on Facebook with this guy. I know we used to date in high school and in college and we were in love and all this, but that has nothing to do with anything. I'm not cheating. I'm just chatting. Is that outright sinful to chat? Everyone's going to have to decide that for their own. Maybe you can't say it's outright sinful that this chatting is happening, but let me tell you this, whether or not it's outright sinful, you can decide for yourself. But here's what I know for sure. It is questionable. As is the husband who says, yeah, I'm sorry, honey. I have to have a lock on my phone and I don't feel comfortable you having access to what that passcode is. Is that outright sinful? I I don't know. You can decide for yourself. But here's what I do know. It is outright questionable. 
and questionable behavior almost inevitably gives birth to outright sinful behavior. And when a straying believer gets caught up in sin, they're not repentant of it. They're not remorseful for it. They're no longer deeply disturbed by it. What you would expect to see in the life of a disciple of Jesus when they sin is, oh my goodness, I failed my Savior and my Lord. I'm so frustrated. What can I do to make sure I get back on the straight and narrow path? But when someone's straying from God and they sin, they don't have anything within a thousand miles of that kind of response. They defend their sin. They justify their sin. They excuse their sin. And that does not mean their sin's excusable. It just means they are straying from God. So you see, loss of holiness is a sign that a believer is straying. Finally, number four is loss of joy. Loss of joy is also a sign that someone is straying from God. You will never meet someone more miserable than the professing disciple of Jesus who is straying from the Lord. Here's why. It's because they have enough of the world in them that prevents them from being able to enjoy God, but they have enough of God in them that prevents them from being able to enjoy the world. And so they are absolutely miserable. The Apostle Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, that the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace. But peace is the very thing that the straying believer does not have. And since they have no peace, they have no joy. And so if you see someone who all of a sudden, they used to have the joy of the Lord, and now they're walking around all sullen and morose, you know that they are likely straying from the Lord. So what do we do when we observe a loss of interest in spiritual matters, a loss of godly priorities, a loss of holiness, or a loss of joy in the life of someone who professes to be a follower of Jesus? What do we do? Well, again, this leads us to our responsibility. There was so much information to sift, sift through in preparation for this sermon, and all of a sudden I had 85 points for you by way of application, and I realized if you give a church 85 points, guess how many of them they're going to do? Zero, all right? So I am going to oversimplify this on purpose because I know it's going to increase your chances, and mine as well, for applying what we've learned. So let me take it all and break it down to two simple application steps. Number one is this. When you see these signs, church, go after the person who is straying. Go after them. Go after them. If Jesus has taught us anything in our text today, he's taught us that it's our Christian responsibility to go after the believer who strayed in the same way that a good shepherd goes after a sheep who has done the same. Now, I'm going to be transparent with you. I know all the dog lovers already hate me because of my opening illustration. <laughs> Let me pave the way for you to hate me more. I'm going to be candid enough to say this. Sometimes when Hunter strayed, I mean, when he did it for the third time in the same day, and this was the 500th time total that he had did it, you know what I thought in my mind? Let the stupid hawks fly him away. Let the bobcats come in and eat him. Let the coyotes and the foxes come. I hope I see a bear. I'm going to point him to where my dog was last seen. Sometimes when, you know, the animal strays, we can get so irritated. And if we're not careful we can adopt that same exact mentality towards a fellow believer who has strayed. They're so annoying. Now I have to have an uncomfortable conversation. Don't they know how uncomfortable I'm going to be in talking to them about them straying? It's really selfish to them, really frustrated with them. Oh my goodness. They know better. They've been to church for a long time. Maybe you said, they were raised in church. They know better. And now they're getting in all this trouble. You know what? Let the consequences of their foolish decisions teach them to get back on the right path. I'm not going to go do it. And that's the spiritual equivalent of let the bobcats get them. Let the bear get them. Let, you know what I mean? It's just like Satan have a field day with them. 
And this is not the loving Christian response. We are not to sit idly by when a friend or family member strays. We're not to say nothing. We're not to do nothing. For that is the very definition of what it means to despise. To not go after them is to act practically speaking as if they have no value like a discarded lottery ticket on the ground. And we dare not do that because then it would be us committing a sin of greater magnitude than the sin being committed by the believer who is straying. So number one, go after them. Here's what you do. You say, hey, can we get together for coffee? Hey, can we get together for lunch? Hey, can we get together uh, by you coming over my house for dinner? Hey, could I catch you for 10 or 15 minutes after small group lets out? Hey, after church today, can we sit in the lobby and just have a chat in one of our nice little seating areas that we have all over the place? Can, can we talk? And when you talk, you say this, hey, I'm not assuming anything. I just want to begin with that. But here's the deal. I've seen, and now you give them what we call camera lens feedback. You tell them specifically the behavior that you're seeing that's caused you to be concerned. And you say, look, I've observed this. Once again, I am not jumping to any conclusions. I'm not jumping straight to judgment. But I do need to tell you, because I love you and I care about you, that what I'm seeing has caused me to be concerned. So I thought instead of just jumping to conclusions and, and just you know, deciding what's going on in your life, I thought I would just get together with you and ask you, so can I do that? How are you doing? And that's how you do it. You go after them. Now this leads nicely to the second step. Number two, once you've gone after them, do what you can to help them. Do what you can to help them. In Galatians 6, the Apostle Paul says this of the straying believer. Uh, Dear brothers and sisters, meaning brothers and sisters in Christ, those of you who are believers, if another believer is overcome by some sin, so friends, there it is again, believers can stray. Believers can get caught up in sin. They can get off the straight and narrow. They can veer from God. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, if another believer is overcome by some sin, if they begin to stray from Jesus, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. So this is the goal, to help them however we can. Now, sometimes we're going to show an interest and show care and concern for their spiritual well-being, and they're not going to be receptive. But even then, we can still do something to help. We can pray for them every day. God, help them to see that there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help them, give them spiritual eyes to see that sin's always going to cost them more than they're willing to pay, and it's always going to take them further than they want to go. God, I just pray that whatever it takes, turn them from this path. God, soften their heart. Help them to become open to Jesus once again. Now, if they are receptive, well, you can go ahead and pray with them right on the spot. Pray with them and help them to rededicate their life to the Lord. Or maybe depending on what was said in the conversation, the appropriate way to help would be to offer uh, a Christian book that you know would help them that has helped you. Or maybe what would be helpful is to invite them to sit with you at church. Maybe you would invite them to join your small group. If they ask you, you could possibly help them with weekly accountability. Although you always want to make sure that this is their idea and not yours, because if it's forced on them, this tends not to be helpful. But bottom line is this, do what you can to help. Number one, you go after them. And then number two, you seek to be helpful to them any way that you can. Now, with this said, let me share one quick disclaimer. I don't want to undo the emphasis that I've been trying to get across to you, but I have to say this as the caveat. You should never assume more responsibility for their spiritual well-being than they do. 
Think of hiring a trainer. You hire the trainer and they share with you all the tips and tricks and they share with you a workout plan, but then they give it to you to do. They don't work out for you because that's really not something that they can do. In the same way, when you go after a straying believer, it's like you're basically offering yourself as a spiritual coach, a spiritual trainer, and you want to give them all the tips and tricks. You might want to give them a workout plan called a Bible reading plan. You want to help them any way you can, but you cannot begin assuming more responsibility for their spiritual walk with God than they do. Once you give them the spiritual workout, they either need to want to get in shape, spiritually speaking, or they don't. You can't help them. You can't have a relationship with God for them. And I mention this because I don't want to take away the triple exclamation mark after Jesus's instruction to us today. Do not despise. I don't want to take away the three explanation marks and bring it down to one. But here's why I'm mentioning this. It's because as human beings, we have a, a tendency to be given to extremes. Do we not? We either don't care at all or then we switch gears and we begin caring way too much. And since truth is usually found in the middle of two extremes, we'll want to be somewhere in the middle. So do what you can to be helpful without assuming all the responsibility. And friends, then you just got to trust God with the result. I don't know how you walked in here today, But if you're like the typical disciple of Jesus, you may have walked in here thinking that to fulfill your Christian responsibility, when you see a family member or friend who's a believer who's straying, you may have thought your responsibility was to report them to someone else. I can't tell you how many times this happens as a pastor. Hey, pastor, can I talk to you real quick? I just have such care and concern about so-and-so and and whatever. They're going off track. Can you go speak to them? And that's when we bring them straight to this passage that we're talking about today. Oh, I could. But if I did, I'd be assuming the responsibility that God the Father has given to you. You will never find any scriptural support that you have fulfilled your responsibility before God by reporting someone else's straying to a pastor, to your team lead, or to your small group leader. I know that this scares some of you to death because the only thing you hate more than hell is confrontation. I get it. It's not easy to do. But friends, just because something's uncomfortable doesn't excuse us from it any more than being uncomfortable sharing our faith excuses us from our responsibility to witness. So friends, this is a responsibility that God has given to every single one of us. So New Day, let's commit to honoring God in this area of our lives. Let's choose to care more what God thinks about us than what the person might think that we go after trying to help. Let's choose to fulfill our Christian responsibility before God. Let's choose to do for others what we hope they would do for us if the roles were reversed. Heaven forbid one day we get off track and it's our soul that's on the path that leads directly to hell. Don't we want someone in the future to show care and concern? Don't we want someone to not treat us like a worthless lottery ticket on the ground? Don't we want others not to walk by us, but to pull us aside with love and care and concern? Well, if that's what you would want from someone else, and that's what you would want others to do to you, then, hey, Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Friends, it's the golden rule. So in everything, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Church, it's uncomfortable at times, but let's step up to the plate. Because you know what? Sometimes the thing that makes all the difference in someone's life is them just showing a little bit of care 
and concern. What can make the difference, all the difference in someone's life is if someone else will step in and just communicate to them a little bit of care, a little bit of concern. Sometimes that tiniest little bit of, I'm concerned about you. I care for you. I want God's best for you. And I know he wants his best for you even more than I do. Sometimes that tiny little gesture is the very thing that is needed to turn someone from being way over here on the path to getting right back on the path that God has for them. So church, what came to mind for you today? Who came to mind for you today as we were talking about people losing spiritual interest, people losing spiritual priorities, people losing a sense of holiness, and people losing a sense of joy? Who did the Holy Spirit bring to your mind? And will you be the one that shows that care and concern to them this week? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for this reminder of our Christian responsibility to go after the straying believer. God, help us to never forget that when we, mankind, were eternally damned in our sins, you didn't sit there in heaven uncaring, unloving. You didn't just walk on by us. You came after us. And God, our prayer today as a church is that you would Help us to follow your good example. God, give us your care, your concern, your love for our fellow believer. Fill our hearts with your love so that anytime we see another believer going around, no, God, help us to never think we're the Holy Spirit police. That is not the ministry you've given us. But God, when we do see someone straying, may we be overwhelmed by your love and your care and your concern. May that be alive and well in our heart so that we can't help but do anything except go after them, trying to steer them back onto the straight and narrow. And God, this is difficult to do, so I pray for courage. God, I'm afraid to speak up. I'm afraid it won't go well. So God, today I put that in your hands. Help me to just be obedient and then trust you with the results. Because God, it's my desire that you would use my life to steer someone back on the right path. Help me, God, fulfill the ministry I have to the believer who strays. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, Mike. This has been a message about the straying believer, but maybe you're here today and you've never been a believer. Maybe you're joining us online or you're in the room with me and you've never actually placed your faith in Jesus Christ. And I just want to say something to you. If that's you and you're here today, before we end our time together, some people walk into a church and they wonder, does God love somebody like me? I hear about God's love, but could he really love me? And if you've ever wondered that, I hope you didn't miss what Mike said in his prayer. He talked about when we go out after straying believers, we're doing exactly what God did for us. When we were yet sinners, the Bible says, that's when Christ died for us. See, God is just, so there has to be a payment for the sin that you and I commit against the holy God. So God is just, and you can trust in his justice, but because he is just doesn't mean that he doesn't also love in fact, the measure that he loves is to the measure of his own son, Jesus Christ. You see, sin had to be paid for. There had to be a payment for the sin. But God said, I love those people so much steeped in their sin that I will send my sinless, spotless son, Jesus, to die in their place for their sins. Jesus rose from the grave. And those of us that place our faith in him, we will be saved. You see, if you think God's just going to love you when you clean up and you get right, you're missing the major point of the gospel. It's that when we were so far from him and we had nothing to offer, that's when he loved us. 
That's when he sent Jesus. And if you've never placed your faith in that, if you've never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ to be that gift from a loving God for you, it's available to anybody that would call upon his name. And if you'd like to do that for the first time today, I want to offer you an opportunity to do that. It's a decision of the heart. But what we want you to do here at New Day is just take out that welcome card that I pointed out. Just grab that on the back of a seat. If you're online, use the links that are provided for you right now. Use the QR code and just let us know. If you're in person, bring that card with you to guest services. They're going to hand you a Bible. They'd love to pray with you. They can answer some questions for you, but they want to get a Bible in your hands if today you're becoming a believer. And again, we'll mail Thanks you that Bible. Thanks for experiencing this message with us. Do you want more New Day Church in your life? Well, please like and subscribe on YouTube and follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Want to take a next step in your faith? Our Church Center app is the best place to get more connected. So just download the free app App on your app store today and be sure to choose New Day Church in Enfield, Connecticut. We are able to offer this sermon and all others like it only because of your faithful financial support. Thank you to all of you who so faithfully give each week. If you feel led to support our ministry financially, just go to our website at newdaychurch.cc forward slash give. Thank you in advance. May God richly bless you and we hope to see you again real soon.